The Coonhound Collective Podcast is brought to you by Conkeys Outdoors because we support the people who support our way of life and CZ Welding and Fabrication. Custom dog boxes built by hunters for hunters. Check these guys out today. This is your host, Jason Snurgrove, and I will be your guide as we journey down the road to pleasure hunt or hitting the long trail to those great cop hunts. This is the Coon Hound Collective It don't have to be, it don't matter. If you like to coon hunt, if you really like to coon hunt, it don't matter if you're hunting a blue tick, a black and tan, a walker, a red bone, a plot, or if you're hunting a gray dog or a cur dog. It don't matter if that dog can do what you want it to do. Can tree a coon like you like for one to tree a coon. If you're going to competition hunt, you know, get him single registered, whatever it is, or hunt him in some of these other, and, and go. Hunting is not a competition. They have competition hunts. Thank you for joining us today on the Coonhound Collective Podcast. Today I am in Blue Eye, Missouri, right on the Missouri-Arkansas line at the Table Rock Sportsman Association with Mr. Junior Laster. How you doing, Mr. Junior? I'm good. I'm good. Mr. Junior, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into coon hunting. I can do that. Uh, I went my first coon hunting when I was six years old. My dad coon hunted. Uh, we had to... Uh, some old, some of them old Arkansas gray and red bones. That's what got me started. A preacher friend of dad's down at Mammoth Springs, Arkansas, had give him a pair of pups. And he raised them up, and they made coon dogs. And then after we moved up here, and him and mom took Bowen Pentecostal Church to pastor in October of 1954, and pastored it 57 and a half years. So I was raised here at Blue Eye, and... Uh, Went to school at Blue Eye and went to college at CVO, College of Ozark. But then uh, I, I just kind of, we had a coon hunt. The first one I went to was at the old Arkansas school building downtown Blue Eye. And we had one down there. And then a few years after that, I showed. And the first show, we had one down at Old Lady Six State Park on Table Rock Lake. And I showed my old Red Ranger dog, and we'd got him single registered through R.C. Crow with Crow's Missouri Red Bones. And uh, I showed him down there and, and won the show, and it burnt me. I mean, all I wanted to do after that was go outside when I'd get in from school, go outside, and I built me a bench. It is an awfulest looking thing you ever seen, and I'd have to put rocks under one side and boards under the other side to get, get it level so they'd stand on it. And I done it every day. And I've been extremely, extremely blessed. I've, I've done a, you know, I've just, the Lord been good to me. Me and my wife was talking the other night. There's no telling how many hundred thousand miles I've drove in the United States of America going to a coonhound event and never had one accident. That's just the mercy and grace of the good Lord is all it is because I've come home. I, on the way home, I remember one time I went to the the Southeast Walker days, hunted both nights and showed both days, and the I was coming down I-40 uh, and from Memphis and I towards Memphis, and I saw a sign that said Memphis, 55 miles. The next thing I remember going right down that road in that Ford truck, I, I overhead, overhead, it said West Memphis. And I mean, I don't remember nothing in between there, but the good Lord had his hand on me now. That's all there is to it. But I've been blessed. I've, I've won, uh, you know, I've made many, many night champions and grand night champions. Probably 70% of what the titles I've put on dogs – I did with dogs that I raised or was our bloodline. Started in 1966, my dad and a friend of ours, Mr. Junior Biggerstaff, went to Ada, Oklahoma, to Mr. Buell Byerman. We'd saw him uh, about two or three weeks before at, down here at Sonora, Missouri, or Sonora, Arkansas at a hunt. 
and they, he had a young dog down there, and everybody there thought he was the prettiest thing, and he was. So Dad told him, he said, uh, he wouldn't sell him to him. They said, Dad told him, said, Mr. Bowerman, if you ever have decide you want to sell that, that dog, would you give me and Mr. Bearstaff a call? About two weeks, he called Dad, and he said, uh, Mr. Laster, he said, I've decided I've got a chance to buy a female, not champion female that I sold, and I may sell old hawk. And Dad said, well, could we come down? He said, you can come down and hunt with him one night or two nights or whatever you want to do. He was about 17 and a half months old. In January, when they left here, they, it was sleeting and colder than blue blazes. They went ahead and drove down there anyhow, went a-hunting one night, turned him loose by himself. He treed a coon in that freezing rain and a big old hollow tree, and the next dump they turned a female loose with him, and they treed one on the outside, and they stayed all night with Buell and his wife, and the next morning over breakfast, they bought Table Rock Flying Hawk and brought him back to Blue Island, Missouri. Boy, I can't hardly talk about that. Now, it just about it just about gets to my heart. I'm just telling you, but uh, and I'm still hunting and showing today that same bloodline from old Flying Hawk. The Lord's been good to me. I, fact is, I've got a young dog, and his daddy uh, was was a dog that I raised. He was out of Old Pearl, and uh, and Val Nelson's on a stable dog, which went back to M Tree Jam and Mundar and all them dogs I raised back there. But that, that dog's daddy, this pup's daddy, had old flying hawk. And I know that you can only go back seven generations on the pedigree, but I know what was back there. In eight generations, he had Brinkley's Ozark Preacher 14 times and Table Rock Flying Hawk 14 times. That's what I, that's what I base my, right now, that's what I've, I've, I've still got that young dog and, and I've just been blessed. But you know, back then, it was different than what it is now. I mean, when I started hunting, we had a carbide. We hunted with a carbide light and a three-cell flashlight. And uh, if you may, if you, which you usually didn't, but if you didn't change your batteries every other night, you you you'd be looking at your last tree in the dark <laughs> with a carbide light. But uh, you know, people. Right here in this, right here at this club where we're where we're sitting, Table Rock Sportsman Association. I had a teacher in the eighth grade out here at Blue High School. His name was Lowell H. Curly White, one of the best men I ever know. And fact is, I just had to go to Verizon Store in Berryville today, and this lady said, uh, asked me where I'm from, and I said Blue Eye, and she said, "You might know some of my family." And I said, I've been there, you know, I mean, I've been there most of my life. I come there when I was five years old, and I'm 72. And she said, uh, I said, who are you talking about? She said, did you know Curly White? And, buddy, I got quiet. I said, he's one of the best friends I ever had. She said, that's my grandpa. And that just made my whole year right there. To, and she lived here in Berryville to get to meet her and just tell her a, a lot of stuff that I knew about her grandpa, Curly White, and how he got me started in this club. And I told I was there for a, probably an hour and 15, 20 minutes, but I told her the whole thing. It meant that much to me, and it did her too. You know, that, that, that's what this is all about. But I've been blessed. I've raised a lot of good pups. I've sold a lot of good pups. Uh, I'm, I don't usually tell, you know, but, but I've raised, uh, I've, I've won, I won't tell you exactly, but I've won over 30 world and national titles, including Autumn Oak, UKC, ACHA, and NKC world shows, well, quite a bit over 30, but, uh, I've, I've, I've been extremely blessed, you know, I've sold some dogs for some big money. I've sold some dogs for some big money. I, I sold a dog for as a young dog, got him back, trained him. Uh, the boy that I that I bought him from the second time, uh, he he had hunted him and had him going good. And two weeks after I bought him, uh, Mundo Junior had had his his daddy had passed away. Two weeks, his name was was Morgan's Tree Jam and Mundo. Two weeks after I bought him, 
I went to a world qualifying hunt in in Clinton, Missouri, won third place. He was just a 18-month-old open registered pup, you know. I drew three Grand Night Champion Blue Ticks and won that cast and qualified me for the world hunt. Two weeks later, I found myself fetting in the final four at the UKC world hunt with him in Ohio. And, uh, I, you know, I'm still, you know, I've got a, I've got a dog right now that's, uh, that's a grand pup to his, which would make him, Mundo Jr. was his daddy, so that would make him, you know. But uh, I, I've been blessed, but I, the main thing I want to get across it don't have to be, it don't matter. If you like to coon hunt, if you really like to coon hunt, it don't matter if you're hunting a blue tick, a black and tan, a walker, a red bone, a plot, or if you're hunting a gray dog or a cur dog. It don't matter if that dog can do what you want it to do, can tree a coon like you like for one to tree a coon. If you're going to competition hunt, you know, Get him single registered, whatever it is, or hunt him in some of these other, and and go. But if you if just for you to go coon hunting, he don't have to be out of this and he don't have to be out of that and he don't have to be registered. If he suits you, you're the one feeding him, and that's just that's just the way it is, you know. I I do. Boys asked me a while ago, but I I you know I I've been blessed. I do a lot of winning, and we've kind of been. I've kind of been figuring up back here for the, you know, a couple, three weeks ago I started figuring. And and I, I do a lot of winning anymore. The thing is, the big thing is at a lot of clubs is to give lights away. You know, good lights. I'm talking about we're giving one here tonight if we get enough dog standard. And, and it's a 250-something dollar light, you know. But uh, I, I, I've got some young guys who started hunting around where I live, around Green Forest and Berryville and Oak Grove and places like that. And we I figured it up the other night, and I've gave, in the last year, I've gave six or seven of them lights away, and I won't even tell you how many pups <laughs> to them kids, because if they come to the house and want to go coon hunting, I'll let the boys, my grandsons, or some of the boys that comes and gets my dogs and take them hunting. Yeah, I'll let, if they go with them a few times and they're going to like it, I'm going to see to it they can get the coon hunt. I've had a accident. Actually, the original was six years ago. It broke my left leg and knee in five places, and my right foot and ankle in three, and and then I had a knee replacement three years ago this last month. And uh, after that knee replacement, a staple went in a vein when they stapled it up and set staph infection up. And I've had five surgeries in three years since March, and that's really slowed me down. But the Lord been good to me. You know, they told Joanne and the kids when I first done that that I probably, as a chance, I might not walk again. That wasn't that wasn't even possible. I know the old boy that put this thing together and made it. He's the same one that can heal it. It's just that simple. But if you're going to hunt, just enjoy it. it. Whatever it is, if it's deer hunting, if it's rabbit hunting, and I've had beagles and some good ones and shot a many a rabbit in front of them. But whatever it is, enjoy it. But there's one thing that I want to stress. Hunting is not a competition. They have competition hunts. They have competition rabbit hunts. They have competition coon hunts. They have competition hunts. But going hunting does not need to be a competition against your buddy and that buddy and this buddy that comes to go with you. It don't have to be a competition. It's supposed to be a pleasurable, enjoyable, go out there and enjoy hunting. God God give you the health and strength to go. God put the animals on the planet. And if he hadn't have put them here for food, I mean, if, if it hadn't have been for, for eating animals and stuff, what would Adam and Eve lived off of? You know, it's pretty simple. Vegetation and stuff like that. But, uh, I mean, just enjoy whatever you're doing and enjoy the people you're doing it with. And if you're hunting a particular bloodline of dogs. Hey guys, this is Jason over at the Coonhound Collective Podcast. Is your dog box starting to get war? Maybe it's starting to get a little crack like mine is. Maybe you've just been thinking about it's time to upgrade to a, to a new box, but... You've asked your buddies and you're just not real sure what direction to go in. Well, let me help you out here. Go check my friends out 
at CZ Welding and Fabrication Custom Doll Boxes and Aluminum Products on Facebook. You can check out all their custom work they do there and their designs that they do. If you don't see something that you don't exactly like there, reach out to Nathan at 540-810-5439, 540-810-5439, or send him a message through the Facebook page. I bet he can fix you up. Don't wait till fall to get that new doll box. Go ahead, get that doll box now. Get you uh, get you something looking good in the back of your truck that, that you can be proud of and that you can haul your dog around in comfort. Check my friends out at CZ Welding and Fabrication. You won't go wrong. Dog boxes built by hunters for hunters. Get yours today. CZ Welding and Fabrication. Just try to improve them. There's several ways. Of course, I had a little bit of advantage. I went to college at CUVO, and the ag director down there was Marvin Otting when I went to school down there. One of the finest, and he hunted with me some with Old Hawk, and he thought he is the finest thing in Central Quaker Roach. But Marvin, he taught me a lot, a lot, a lot about genetic breeding when I was down there. Agriculture was my minor. But he, his theory was, if you've got a dog you like, or a cow or whatever, of course his was Holstein's, but if you breed to want to stay in that bloodline, line breeding is good. There's a big difference. A lot of people don't think so. They just don't know no better. But line breeding and inbreeding is a big difference. When you inbreed, you're breeding back into the same family. You're breeding mama to son or mama to daughter or daddy to daughter or something. That's the same family. When you're line breeding, you're breeding uh, it breeding a daughter to her daddy, but when you're inbreeding, you're breeding brothers and sisters and real close cousins and stuff like that. That's what inbreeding is, breeding back into the same family. Line breeding can be breeding a father to daughter. The One of the best crosses, some of the best crosses we ever made on no flying hawk was breeding granddaughters of his back to him. And and I'm still, you know, that's why that's why old hawk was in, is in my mundos, uh, was in that hawk dog I had, which is my mundo dog's daddy that I've got now. He was in eight generations old flying hawk 14 times and bring these old preacher 14 times. That's that's what you call line breeding to the ultimate right there. But I've just in uh, I just encourage you to do it. <clears throat> I I don't have any of them. I may do another one, but I wrote a book uh, several years back on how to pick, raise and train a show dog. I had 2,500 of them printed, and I've got 10 of them left. The way I, on the first deal, I was writing an article for Coonhound Bloodline, UKC's magazine, and on the first article I wrote after that, I put an article in there. I put in my article that the first 15 kids that would send me their address, and I give them mine, would send me their address and tell me that they, that they read that, I would send them one of them books. Well, I mean, how do you tell number 16 that he can't have a book? I ended up sending 74 of them things to kids, but that's probably the best 74, that, you know, because some of them I've showed against some of them, you know, and they're good. They, That's what makes me happy. When I go to a bank show or, oh, I went to Autumn Oak one year. i got to tell you this. I went to Autumn Oak one year, and I, I didn't know, I, I went, Mr. Timothy Ball got a hold of me down here in Oklahoma, me and James Merchant, and wanted us to come down and do a youth, a young coon hunter's youth camp down there for him. We had five days, and I taught them how to, you know, show one and stuff like that of a day, and then we hunted of a night, and we taught them the rules during the day, and then we hunted of a night, and then the Saturday night of the thing, we had a competition hunt, a competition show, and a competition hunt that night. And, uh, it was it was the neatest thing you ever seen, but uh, the the best my heart has ever felt winning the world shows, winning Autumn Oak. I'm I'm probably the winner in Tanner at Autumn Oak. I've won it four times a national grand show champion, twice with my own dog, and uh, with Mundo Junior. And uh, but anyhow, this young guy's showing it Autumn Oak, and this young kid, uh, it was like sixty something dogs in his class. And they had to break it down. They'd show like eight and eight and eight, you know. 
And then they brought us all back. It was the last was eight winners, so I mean they had to be sixty. You know that's what it'd be like because they were showing eight. And that this young guy, probably sixteen years old, he won that thing. And man, he had a nice dog. He'd worked that dude, and he he knew me because I seen him. Kept looking back there. And I thought, Bub, I wish you wouldn't do that. You're going to get beat watching me, you know. And he won that thing. He dropped his dog lead, turned his dog loose, and here he come. And the, his dog just running down through there, and his trophy sitting on the bench, hollering, Mr. Junior, Mr. Junior, if it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't be here. And then he, I didn't, still didn't know when he said, I was at your teaching at Timothy Ball's youth camp, and, and boy, now you talk about making a country boy feel big now. That, that, was, that was one of my better moments right there in that, in that deal. Well, that, that is for sure what it's about, is, is bringing people into mm. to the sport a, any way you can. And while we're on the subject of bench showing, <laughs> I don't want you to give all your secrets away, but share a few tips for somebody that maybe is wanting to get into <clears throat> bench showing that they can kind of get started with yeah, and what I, you think. I'd be glad to. The first thing you got to do is find – you can go on that website on the Walker or Blue Tick or whatever breed associations and get the standards that that dog is supposed to look like. These pictures on there, get a, how I started, let me back up here, how I started, Dad, out here at the barbershop at Blue Eye, Mr. Dwayne Flowers, Blue Tick icon, Dwayne Flowers was a real good friend. We met him out there at the barbershop one day, and he used to bring some of his full crime magazines out there and leave them at the shop. Just trying to get paid. Well, Dad brought one of them things home, and I looked through there, and I was just intrigued. I read nearly the whole book and didn't even know what I was reading. And all of a sudden, I got towards the end, and there was a Walker female that Bob Bagel at Booker, Texas, had won a bench show with. And I thought, that's the prettiest thing i ever seen. And I'd take that magazine. I, I had me a bench built out of two befores, and I don't know what, but I'd take that magazine and set it on something to where I could look at that dog, and then I'd that picture, and then I went to just trying to make my dogs look just like that one. If she won in Texas, mine can win up here. And that's how I got started. And I, I, I met Bob after that and told him what I said, and he and he he remembered that female, you know. But that's But just work them. When you, one thing, if they don't do just right, and I've been guilty of this sometimes, especially if I, they know a little bit more than what they're acting like, don't get too rough with them. Just if they move a foot, just take a muscle on the other side or, you know, their leg or something on the opposite side, squeeze it just lightly to where they got to put weight on the feet and put it back in place. And then just, just keep working like that. It may take a while. That's the way I done. But just be patient and don't, 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 don't get too zealous with what you're doing, you know. Well, I, I know I've interviewed uh, Miss Natalie Atkins that shows dogs. And she that was the one of the big points she stressed is get the head right, but be patient at be the patient. same time. Be patient, yeah. And Natalie knows. I'm, <laughs> I'm just telling you she does. And she's had some good ones. And it makes me feel good because some of the ones that she really started with were some of the ones that I've just been talking to you about was out of that same bloodline, you know. But uh, but I, you know, Mr. Val Nelson, Natalie, you know, uh, this, this, this Frank Dooley in Oklahoma, just numbers of them that that we've showed together and and we've you know we don't always see eye to eye but we're always friends that's the main thing right there just if you if you think you got you know a little bit well i should have done this and i should have done that maybe you should have you probably should have in your eye but you're not the eye that day the judge is and and he's got the final say and i love it i, I it makes me feel so good when these young men around Berryville and Green Forest and Oak Grove, Arkansas, where I live, come to the house on Friday and Saturday night. Mr. Junior, can I borrow you a light? And can we take old Jewel or can we take, you know, whatever? Can we take old Lassie and can we take Kid? And can When they come there and start doing that, now, even though I can't hunt since I broke my legs much and I'm getting better to where I can, I broke them six years ago, three years ago. I had a knee replacement, and I've had five surgeries since, and staph infection is, is it 
it about stopped me. But it didn't. I'm back on my feet, and I'm, I'm fixing to climb back in the woods. But just remember, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, it don't make no difference. Give God the thanks for getting you there. Give God the thanks for bringing him home. And every time you can scoop a, a, scoop a dog feed out and feed it to your dog, he helped you do that. That's, that's yeah. the thing that, you need to and, remember. And that's the most important thing most in, in, important in life thing. for sure. Before, I, I know we got a bench show coming up that, you, that you're that you going to have to judge. Before we do, real quick, if, I, I mean, this may not be easy to go quick through, but start at Hawk and, and tell us these dogs down through through the through the lineage okay. there. Uh, from Hawk. Hey, guys, this is Jason over at the Coonhound Collective Podcast. I'm here today to tell you about one of our sponsors, Cocky's Outdoors. Whether you need a few dog collars or the whole setup, they can fix you up. They have a wide range of products from hound hunting to fishing. My friends over at Cocky's Outdoors can help you out. You can order online at conkeysoutdoors.com. Call them at 904-692-1568, 904-692-1568, or if you're in the Hastings, Florida area, go by and see them. Again, that's at conkeysoutdoors.com because we support Support people who support our way of life. I had a dog called uh, Lassiter's Flying Hawk Jr. He was out of Ray Richardson's Vicky female, which was out of, uh, she was out of Fender River Chief and Richardson Dolan Lady. He was a litter, a full brother, a uh, litter uh, older than Sugarloaf Chief, Tony Rogers Sugarloaf Chief. And uh, that, that was one. And then I had a dog called Tree Talking Spot. He was out of Old Hawk, and his mother was out of Stan Sailor Jr. and uh, and Richardson's Vicky. And then I had uh, Hawk Supreme. He was out of Old Hawk, and his mother was out of Stan Sailor Jr. and Old Vicky, a different female. We had two of them, uh, them sisters. And then I come down from there, and I had. Uh, Oh, I've had several. I had Bigger Staff's Little Buck that I won the a, a NKC World Show with. And, and and if you want to really know the story behind Bigger Staff's Little Buck, go over to, to my YouTube channel. Me and Mr. Junior sat down. It's probably been close to a year ago. Yeah, probably. And, and, and he, he told the whole story on that. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you what, it it is a great story to go listen to. And uh, maybe we can insert some of that audio here so you can hear it. But go ahead, Mr. Jim. And And if you can do that, I want all of you kids that's, that's – I want you to listen to that bit on Bigger Staff Little Buck, and then you can understand what happens when you're just a country boy and you pick a dog out and you, you make that dog what he is. Of course, I didn't make Bigger Staff Little Buck. He was a coon dog when I got him. I, he was raised right here, Burt Smith, right here at Bearville, Arkansas. Uh, Bred took his mama down to Junior Bigger Staff. Junior was keeping Old Hawk and bred him at, at uh, Old Hawk and raised Little, and raised little Bucks, at, uh, Little Buck, and, and he, Bigger Staff picked him out as a puppy, as a stud feed puppy. And then he sold him at about, oh, not hardly two years old to a fella in Texas by the name of W.D. Harmon. W.D. called me one day and he said, Junior, I'm going to sell Little Buck. I said, well, W.D., what are you calling me for? I can't afford Little Buck. You know, I know what, he, what you've done, you know. He'd won the world show with him and he was a grand champion and liked just a, fir- a first place win being a night champion. He said, I'm going to sell him. He said, I want you to have him to see what you can figure out. Well, I'm not going to tell you exactly how I got it, but my wife stayed with me through it. <laughs> and it's been over 50 years now. But uh, we had a little bit of savings account, and I had to go to the bank and borrow the rest of it. And I told him, I said, WD, I'm going to buy your dog, but there's a trick. He said, what's that? And I said, well, I want your dog, and I think I can do big things with him. And I've got the money to buy him, but you're going to have to bring him to me because I don't have the money to come and get him. And he got tickled, and I said, no, I'm not kidding you, WD. That's the way it's going to be. I want you, dog. That was on Thursday, and on Tuesday, he brought him to me. And I took him. He had a second-place win. I took him to a hunt Friday night at Western Grove, Arkansas, and won first place with him, UKC hunt. I'd hunted him two nights after I got him. Saturday night, I took him to Gainesville and won first place with him and finished him into a night champion within the week after I bought him from WD. 
won the, won the world show with him, uh, UKC world show with him, won the NKC world, I mean, yeah, the NKC world hunt with him. And uh, he was a, he was an icon in his own, in his own right. And I mean, one of the prettiest horn, clear horn males you ever heard on a tread walker dog. He was a, he, and then I sold him. I had a guy come down and uh, he went hunting with me. They just come down, he went hunting with me and he said, uh, that's a nice dog. And I said, yeah, it is. And, and I, you know, we got talking about it and stuff. And I went on for him. And I said, I wouldn't do it. But then I met a fella from West Virginia. I drew out with him at Walker Days in Peru, Indiana. And he was hunting a good dog that he'd give a lot of money for. And Little Buck put on the show. I mean, he was in his Arkansas redneck bathing suit, and he put on the show. And uh, we got back to the clubhouse, to the fairgrounds, and that guy come over and put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, Junior, what would it take to buy old Buck tonight? I didn't stutter. I didn't. I ain't going to tell you what I said, but I just turned around and quoted him a five-figure number, and he said, uh, whew, man, that's a lot of money. And I shouldn't, have, <laughs> I shouldn't have said what I did. But I said, well... You told me you give just a little more than half that for yours, and I doubled your score. He doubled your score tonight. If he yours is worth as much as you give for him, mine ought to be worth twice that much. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I didn't sell him to him. I brought him home, and I told Joanne, I called Joanne, my wife, and told her, and she said, honey, I didn't want you to buy him, but I ain't going to tell you to sell him. Do what you want to. And so then about two weeks later, we got a little farm did have where I was born and where Dad was born and raised down in Springs, Arkansas. Me and her and Dad was going down there to work cattle. We had cattle on it. And I'd, we'd stayed all night down with Mom and Dad so the kids wouldn't have to get up so early to go to school. And I just went in. I told Joanne that night. I said, honey, I'm going to call that guy and sell him a buck. I mean, that's, that's not even feasible for us to turn down that kind of money for a walker dog that's five years old it, it's just not even i walked in the living room come upstairs and walked in the living room she was helping mom cook breakfast and i just reached for the phone at mom and dad's and when i did my hand got about six inches from it and it rang and it was the fella in west virginia he said junior you still got old buck and I started to tell him, yes, sir, buddy, but you just cost yourself some money by not letting me call you instead of you call me. But anyhow, I, I'm, we worked out a deal, and he sent me part of the money. And uh, like he said he would on Tuesday, I went to a hunt that next weekend at Bentonville, Arkansas, and bought a dog called Big Mac. And, uh, I, I mean, I drew out with him, and I was hunting a, my dad's dog, a dog of my dad's. And and he 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 worked on me pretty good. Me and, and uh, so when we started back in, you know, I bulletproof. I had a little bit of money and I from old Buck, and we started back in. And I said, "What would it take to buy old Mac tonight?" He told me, and I just reached in the bed of my overalls and got my checkbook, and I said, "Will you take a check?" And he said, "Well, well, 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 well what are you gonna do?" And I said, "I'm gonna buy your dog. You priced him to me." Well, well, well I don't wanna sell my dog, and I said, "You done did." I just rode her out and gave it to him and brought the dog home on Friday night. He won first place in that ACHA qualifying hunt, and I took him back down there Saturday night, hunted with him one night, won first place with him again. So I go to I get out to Walker Days, and uh, this fellow that bought old Buck was there, and I got to tell him about him. We was down at the motel room signing the papers, you know, and he was finishing paying me for old Buck and stuff, and we was visiting and having a good time. And he said, I said, boy, Cl I bought a good dog last weekend. How good is he? I said, he's good. And I told him what the deal was, and he said, what do you take for him? I told him, and he said, here, hold on just a minute. You want me to add that to this check, or do you want me to write another check? <laughs> and he bought him, and I kept him and hunted him for him for about a year and a half and finished him into a triple dual grand champion hunting show in UKC, NKC, and ACHA. He was up sure enough nice nice hound called him big mac but i've just been so blessed my 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 wife my family my mom and dad i mean my wife i'm just telling you we've been married over 50 years and she's just you know it's been tough but 
me going to the hunts and stuff and going to hunting and stuff all the time, she's got to be the sweetest bowl of sugar that ever was because she's just very seldom. I mean, if I just got too carried away and she wasn't feeling good or something, but she hunted with me a lot before the kids come along, you know, and when they come along and got in school, that was a different deal. But we've got three kids, 12 grandkids, and eight grandkids and maybe another or two on the way. I'm not sure, but God's blessed us. And, uh, you know, if you ever get in this Ozark Mountain country, look us up. We're in the Oak Grove, Arkansas phone book. And if you come on Sunday morning, you'll find us at Green Forest Cowboy Church in Green Forest, Arkansas. Okay, I, I know we got to cut this thing off here in just a minute, but you got a coon hunting story you can tell us? Something well, funny yeah, or serious, just lay I, it on us. I was, just, I was just thinking of one just a little bit back. I remember one night that I was, we was hunting over, at Minchie, Missouri, over by a game warden's house. And, and uh, you know, I, I didn't kill a lot of coons out of season and stuff, but uh, all of a sudden, we heard this car coming down the road. Joanne was with me. We heard this car coming down the road. And uh, I said, honey, honey, we turned the lights off. So we turned the lights off, and he come down the road and kind of slowed down, and I said, you think that's a game warden? She said, I don't know. But they, he drove on down the road and went on down the road outside. Well, during that period of time, we kind of lost track of our dogs. And we had Hawk Jr. and Old Flying Hawk. And we couldn't tell. Of course, this is before tracking systems. I mean, you, they, they hadn't even never, you, you hadn't, everybody didn't even hardly have radio, much less tracking collars. And she said, and no cell phones, period. And she said, where'd the dogs go? Now, I don't know. When they, they'd hit a coon before this all happened, and they just kept going, kept going. We got out of here. We went home and left them, which is hard to do. Went back over the next day, couldn't find them. Went back the next night, couldn't find them. Dad had, we made up some handbills and flyers and printed them up. Joanne and I drove and passed them out to everybody over there. Not that was on, not that night, but the, but the third night, from the time we lost him, an old boy called. He said, because I'd left my phone number and stuff with everybody over there. Is this Junior? I said, yeah, it is. Of course, it wasn't no cell phone, just home phone. He said, I hear a dog barking off in here from my house. And I, he said, it might be yours. So, boy, we just loaded the truck and went over there. We got over there. He said, they've been down there for a day or two. And I said, what? This was like on Thursday. He said, they've been down there. I said, I ain't too sure the first time I didn't hear them was Monday morning. I said, you, you're, you're, something's wrong. It ain't mine. So anyhow, me and Joanne got in the car and we took off over and drove up there. And they had been there so long that all you could hear was just, uh, uh, when we drove down there. He told us right where they're at. And we drove down there and you couldn't even tell what it was. We got down there, we drove down through his field and got down there, and it was Hawk and Hawk Jr., and they was treed. They ain't that, it wasn't that kind of tree dog, but what the deal was, it was a holler tree. And we went back and got a chainsaw and sawed it down because I wanted to see what the deal was. They had a, there was a knot hole, it was a hole about five foot high, four and a half, five foot high on that tree. And that old coon was in the bottom of that tree, in that, and she would stick her foot out and fighting at them dogs while they was barking. She had kittens in her, and she was fighting at them dogs. And whenever we chopped the tree down, and we went ahead and killed her, we saved the kittens and brought them home, but we went ahead and killed her. And she had done that so much, they had about half of her front foot chewed plum off, fighting at her and reaching and getting her. And I, I mean, you couldn't even tell what it was. I couldn't even tell what dogs it was, but they had they had stayed right there. If she had just stayed in her, you know, but she couldn't. She just wanted to get out. She wanted to get something to eat for them kittens, you know, and stuff. That probably is 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 good a story as I can tell you right there. And we saved the kittens and raised them and give them away for pets. Of course, we killed her. She'd have died anyhow with that foot and let the dogs kill her. They was a pond about 75 yards just down from that tree. And he said, sometimes I don't hear them. Well, they just had a path. We're down there to that pond back and forth, going down there to that pond to get them to drink water. 
But they was right there, stayed there three and a, the rest of that night, and then three more days we got them just before dark that third day. And uh, but that's that's that and that's a true story. That just and people tell that Joanne every once in a while we talk about it, you know. But that's just it makes you go back and remember that. And then I wonder why I've been so blessed. Why I've stayed at it with this same bloodline of dogs so long, and why I'm so adamant, big time, really adamant about getting kids involved in coon hunting i just got one more thing i want to say if you can keep them in the woods with a dog beagle foxhound coonhound whatever it is if you can keep them in the woods with a dog on a creek bank with a fishing pole or at grandma and grandpa's house with family you got a whole lot better chance of amounting to something and growing up to be the kind of american that you you feature you you want them to be when they become adults god bless y'all love you and if you ever need me just get me on facebook junior lassiter or message me or whatever you need to do and i'll be glad to help you thank you well mr junior i sure appreciate you sitting down with me again i i know this is the second time we've done this and we uh we had a few obstacles to get over but i was glad to be able to get down here and uh sit down with you and get this done and like i said if if you want to see the other stores, Mr. Paul Jeffries, or, or hear the whole story about Little Buck, you can go over to the YouTube channel. It was Crane Creek Kennels. I've changed the name to match the podcast, The Coonhound Collective, and you can go over and check that, that whole story out there. And until next time, we're going about to hit the woods here, boys. Thanks, guys, for listening to the Coonhound Collective podcast today. We really appreciate you taking your time out of your day to listen to the podcast. If you don't mind, head over to Facebook and give us a like, and head over to Instagram and give us a follow. It's both at the Coonhound Collective. Also, if you would like to reach us here at the Coonhound Collective, you can reach us at the Coonhound Collective at gmail.com. If there's someone that you would like to hear on the podcast or a product that you would like to hear talked about, please send it to the Coonhound Collective at gmail.com. Thanks again. Have a great day.